Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I could have your attention, please, I'd greatly appreciate it. In approximately 10 minutes, we will begin service. I know no one leaves home without their trusty cell phones. This is the time to take it out of your pocket or pocketbook, and please do silence them or turn them off. We greatly appreciate your cooperation. Thank you so much.
to search and a time to quit searching. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to love and a time to hate. What do people really get for all their hard work? I concluded there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And what is happening now has happened before. And what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes things, the same things happen over and over again. I said to myself in due season, God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. And I also thought about the human condition. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. We greet you in the name of Jesus Christ at the celebration of life. For Mr. Ronald Murphy Sr., I do introduce to you, present to some, and introduce to others, the officiant for this celebration of life. And this is Reverend Kathy Smallwood. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. We're here to celebrate life and a life that was lived most abundantly. Let's give a round of applause to our brother Murphy, our Baba, our Obi-Wan Kenobi, our wise man in Jesus' name. Woo, woo, woo. All right, we're going to be all the way live. <laughs> Amen. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I bring you greetings on behalf of the senior pastor of this great church, the Reverend Dr. Glover. I bring you greetings on behalf of the eulogist, the Reverend Dr. DeForest Bustasaurus. And so please feel welcome. Uh, please sit down in Jesus' name. And on behalf of the Murphy family, we thank you for being here. All of us in here feel like we're part of the Murphy family. Amen. So let us feel welcomed. Let us bow our heads. Most gracious and holy God, in times like these, we need a savior. In times like these, we need an anchor so that our anchor will hold. Lord, we come before you on this day of destiny to celebrate the life of Ronald Murphy. Oh, how he was just a great tapestry, bringing all the threads of our lives together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we lift up the Murphy family, the children, the grandchildren, even the great-grandchildren, those who are here and those who have gone beyond. Oh, Heavenly Father, let them know that it's more than a cliche that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Know that their daddy and their grandpa, pop, pop, that he's experiencing joy, unspeakable joy right now. Heavenly Father, let them remember all his wise sayings. Let them remember all the jokes that he will tell. Lord, let them remember the barbecues. Thank you, Jesus. And the Kwanzaa meals. Thank you, Lord. Let them remember, most importantly, the love the deep abiding love that he has for each and every one of us. And I am convinced that not even death can separate us from his love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time, we will have a musical selection, It Is Well With My Soul by Jonathan Dewberry, followed by an Old Testament reading, Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, by Kenyon Murphy, Kurt, I'm sorry, I practiced these words, forgive me. Kern and Murphy, the grandson, New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8, by Jakeem Johnson. In that order, please.
when sorrows like sea-bills roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say.
Um, good morning. Um, so I just want to introduce myself and my cousin, uh, also my best friend. This is my longest friend. And uh, the way that we met was at Grandpa and Grandma's house. Um, there was a lot of fights in the backyard <laughs> that I can remember, but also a lot of great times. Um, and so we decided to go a little off program and read this together um, because that's kind of how we used to get in and out of trouble, is together. So I'll start and then um, I'll let my cousin finish up behind me. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jakeem. I'm the older cousin, but he wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> OK, before I get started, I just want to um, talk about a story that my mother told me that you know made me laugh um, about Murphy's thing, which was you know before my time. Uh, so <laughs> everyone was hanging out in Murphy's thing, and it was it was you know good time. And then a lady walks in and <laughs> she yells, "Man, it sure is hot in Murphy's thing." <laughs> so <laughs> I always thought that was funny, but <laughs> all right. Okay, so if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it can keep no record or of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled, where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Thank you. Thank you. I will be reading the obituary. Uh, you can follow along with me, remembering Ronald Murphy. Ronald Murphy Sr. was born and raised and educated in and a proud native of New Jersey, proud brother of Bruce and Barbara Harlan and Sister Dale. He was predeceased by his mother, Alice Murphy, and father, Alec Miles, and siblings, Andy, Candy, Connie, and Allison. Ronald had diverse interests from a very young age and tried a myriad of careers before discovering librarianship which was his true calling. He worked in such varied fields as baking, bank baking, insurance, and the US Postal Service before, before becoming the proprietor of Murphy's Thing, Inc., a neighborhood deli and grocery store that was actually a precursor to Niche, the Neighborhood Information Center Helps Everyone, was an information and referral pilot project of Montclair Public Library, which operated out of a local storefront on Bloomfield Avenue, where Murphy worked as a community research associate. 
Niche moved into the Montclair Public Library in 1977, and in 1979, Director Michael Con Connell appointed him head of circulation. While serving in this capacity, Murphy attended Rutgers University School of Communications, Information, and Library Science earning his master's degree in 1983. He continued his library career at Montclair, becoming division chief of operations. In addition to starting the library's first African-American book discussion group, he distinguished himself during his long service at Montclair Public Library by participating in local, state, national, and international organizations, such as the New Jersey Library Association, Black Librarians of New Jersey, Public Library Association, American Library Association, Black Caucus of the American Library Association, and People to People, through which he and other teachers and librarians traveled to China and to Cuba to interact with their counterparts there. One of Murphy's accomplishments, of which he was justifiably most proud, was that he influenced, recommended, and or helped upwards of 30 people to attend library school to become librarians. Murphy's community work has included involvement with the NAACP, CORE, Community Advisor to the Montclair High School Black Student Union, and we still thank him for all the turkey sandwiches he gave us when we boycotted and sat in. Amen. I'm sorry, I digress. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Um, uh, Murphy was a, oh, at, at, to the Black Student Union Glenfield Park Advisory Board, the Essex County Youth and Rehabilitation Commission, and is a founding member of the Million Man March Montclair. Murphy was an avid pho photographer. In addition to providing photographic history of such local events as the African American Heritage and Fourth of July parades and the recent 30 year history, of the Montclair Public Library, his photographs captured their subject matter and translated them through the prism of Murphy, Murphy's depth of understanding and his appreciation of and zest for life. One of the greatest joys of his life was working with the Montclair Child Development Center, Inc. He served as the board chair for 13 years until he transitioned to board member emeritus in 2023. He enjoyed working with the board and the staff, attending events and taking pictures, especially of the children. His love and dedication to the agency will be remembered fondly. Ronald did enjoy the support of his wife of 64 years, Marva Taylor Murphy, who predeceased him. Ronald was also predeceased by his beautiful daughter, Marva. He was the proud father of Ronald Jr., Dawn, Roger, Son, Son Amy, and Tim, loving grandfather of Rajon, Jalika, Jaquin, Joanna, Kernan, Tristan, and Tara, a doting grandfather on Zalea, Anala, Yakazer, Kahir, and Sairi. Murphy was an advisor, mentor, friend, and surrogate father to countless others. And he was a surrogate grandfather to my two daughters who could not be here. They once asked me after one of the barbecues, why did Mr. Murphy always call me turkey? Why, why is he calling you turkey? And I said, because that was always my order at Murphy's thing. Praise God. But my daughters want to send their love and blessings, first and foremost, to the Murphy family. Thank you for sharing him with them as their grandfather, but also to this whole village of Montclair that raised them. They send their love, and they love you back. All right. We will next have a musical selection witnessed by Jonathan Dewberry. After Mr. Dewberry, we will hear remarks May I please advise everybody that we do have one eulogist today. That's Reverend Dr. Soares. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and so we will have um, remarks from the fourth ward emeritus councilwoman, Dr. Renee Baskerville, Roger Terry and Audrey Fletcher Lee, deputy chief of police emeritus of Montclair and fourth ward emeritus councilwoman. I uh, will have after that another selection by Jonathan Dewberry, followed with remarks from Tanya Poteet, 
Executive Director of Montclair Child Development Center, Betty Turok, Dean Emeritus, Rutgers University, and Nia Gill, Senator Emeritus of the State of New Jersey. In that order, thank you. My soul is a 
Habari Ghani, y'all. I met Baba Duane when I was about 13 years old and uh, started in Montclair High School. And if you lived in the south end of town like I did, in order to get to Montclair High School, you had to go down Forest Street and you had to go past, um, they said Murphy's Thang. I don't know anything about Murphy's Thang, but we knew about going in and getting sandwiches from Murphy's Sandwich Shop. So you had to go that way. And so every day we would start, we started out going there because he had the best sandwiches. Um, as you heard we, about the turkey and cheese, that was everybody's favorite. But I noticed that we were getting so much more than just a sandwich there. We were getting encouragement and we were getting wise counsel and a listening ear. And he was more than an entrepreneur and a proprietor, he was a safe haven. Uh, during those times, it was a time of some discourse that was going on in the school. For example, we were still trying to figure out how to integrate schools. We were learning about our greatness as African American people and we were exposing our hair for the beautiful hair that it was with these afros and beautiful African prints and we were walking around with a sense of pride that at that time was a little bit threatening for some people who weren't quite ready for that and that was happening in the high school. And Baba Duante was, was always there for us. I remember when we were running from the high school after perhaps accidentally turning over some tables or chairs in the cafeteria. Um, and I saw the brothers in the back, but I'm not going to call you all by name. And we would go by, and Baba would provide safe haven for us. He played an especially significant role in the lives of the young teens who were trying to grow up too early and perhaps trying to figure out that young adult thing, maybe trying to be more adult than they should. They always knew that Baba was going to be there and he was not going to, there was no fear when they went there of condemnation or exposure or passing judgment. He was just there for us. And so I, I know you're going to hear from the eulogist, and, and I appreciate everyone else who talked about the sandwiches, and people talked about his lenses. There's one thing that I thought I'm not sure that anyone was going to talk about, so I, I just wanted to, to share this with you. Um, what, I, what I recall the most, and that touches my heart every time I think about him, is that he was the secret keeper. And he knew more about anybody and everybody in the township of Montclair because he was trustworthy and honorable person. And so I looked up and I saw this poem by this sister. Her name is Hurea Iftar. And it goes like this, and I think it's so appropriate. Family, I hope you can feel that. Others of you who had that close and intimate relationship with Murphy who understood your secrets were safe, he took your secrets to the grave. I just wanted to share this with you. I think stars have heard more secrets than any pair of human ears. They're trusted with our troubles and our guards of all our fears. Perhaps we share with them our sorrows, for they too have known the night, yet they've learned to let the darkness simply emphasize their light. Baba Duwane was a secret keeper along the lines of the stars and heard more secrets than most human ears. He was trusted with our troubles and was the guardian of our fears. Baba Duwane was our secret keeper. You could talk to him about anything and you felt secure because you knew that Baba knew the night and learned to let the darkness simply emphasize the light. Family, I thank you so much for sharing him with us. He, he just played such an integral role in my development. Farewell, Entrepreneur Murphy, Baba Duwani. Farewell, Secret Keeper and Social Documentarian. Farewell, my friend and wise counsel. Farewell, my star. Now, cracks a noble heart. Sweet good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. God bless you all.
Good morning, everybody. I think I can truthfully say the family's in the house. The family is in the house. And we got to stop meeting like this. And we got to do something about it. And we will. And we will. I don't think Murph would have it any other way. Roger, why don't you start? Want me to start? Yeah, okay. I want you to start. Good morning. First of all, I want to say my condolence to the Murphy family, Ron, Dawn, Sean, my family, as you heard. Uh, Reverend Kathy Smallwood Johnson say a little earlier, you know, we grew up right in the same area, Norfolkton Avenue, Bar Street, Walnut Street, Rand Park. I see some of the people from that area here today. You know, uh, it was a wonderful time. And your father was right there for us every step of the way. Mm -hmm. You know, I also want to ask if there's any individuals from the Black Student Union from 68 and 69, would you stand up, please, for a moment? Mm -hmm. Those individuals were. Uh, Waymakers, individuals who started the ball rolling, and Murphy was right there for us to assist us, as you heard Dr. Baskerville speak about. Also, I'd like to have the uh, Million Man Montclair individuals. Would you stand up, please? The ones that are here from that. We all went down to the uh, Capitol that fine day, a million of us, and we didn't storm the Capitol either or do any damage. We respectfully came together and came back to our communities to do work. And that was part of what Mr. Murphy did also. Just briefly, I'm not gonna read the whole proclamation. I have one here from the Township of Montclair the council and the mayor. Uh, it's kind of redundant of some of what we already heard, but I'll read part of it. Whereas Murphy Community Work has included involvement with the NAACP, core community advisor to the Montclair High School's Black Student Union, Glenfield Park Advisory, the Essex County Youth and Rehabilitation Commission, and the founding, one of the founding members of Me and Man Montclair. Mr. Murphy was an extraordinary community leader. He faithfully mentored and assisted in building character in many young people from his store on the corner of Forest and Label. He also inspired many young artists and musicians by hanging out and hanging their creations in the store window, allowing performances in his store. He was the catalyst in helping young African Americans to identify with their rich culture and heritage. In times where there was social unrest in the community, he stood as a beacon, giving individuals knowledge and guidance. Therefore, the mayor and the council of the Township of Montclair hereby recognize the remarkable contributions of Ronald Murphy over the course of his life express the thanks of a grateful community and extend his sympathy to his many family members and friends who will cherish his memory. Thank you. I think Buster's trying to tell me something. What you want, Bus? Butcher's always pulling my coattail, letting me know what I should do and what I shouldn't do. This young man, when he was at Montclair High School, and um, just a brief aside, and we had uh, some of y'all from Montclair, I know you would remember this, um, we had the sit-in at Glenfield School because the Board of Education didn't want to put our kids down in the basement, okay? Turned around, we were sitting in the school, because we couldn't leave, we were in there for five days. 
We couldn't leave because they'd lock us out. Looked out the window one day, a bunch of students from Montclair High School came marching down Maple Avenue to support us. Buster Sories and his crowd. Because we're all together in Montclair. That's what Ron Murphy stood for. That's who he was. And all of what he put into us is what we carry forward. Now, that's why we're here as a family, because of the, the, the things that Ron Murphy believed in and taught us. I was a little kid running up and down Forest Street, and my father had a garage, automobile garage, in the back of Murph's store. But before it was Murph's store, the Riddles had that store on the corner, remember? Okay, and when they left, you know, well, where are they going? Well, I don't know where they went, but I know who came in after them, and it was Murph, and he just carried it through. You know, he, 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 he came on the scene on Forest Street and made sure that all of us running up and down Forest Street did what we were supposed to do, because that's the way our neighborhoods were run back in the day, all right? We were all one big family. So I will always, always remember and carry with me, because it's part of who I am, what Ron Murphy stood for, and that's what you all of you have. I'm looking at this front row right now and the row behind, that's who you are. And you will never forget it. We'll never let you forget it. And I'm seeing his brother back there shaking his head and looking just like Murph. Yeah, he called me Turkey, I call him Turkey too. We love Murphy. I have a, a, a rock proclamation from the Montclair Child Development Center because, you know, um, I was the executive director of that program for a number of years, and, um, and the only way it lasts, because from that Glenfield time, when we fought for the, oh, and by the way, you know, you all know, we got our five classrooms, and we were not in the basement, okay? We were not in the basement. And the only way that that happened, and that we were able to maintain it to this day, is because we had strong people involved in the program to make sure that we didn't go back. No going back, okay? And when I was in the position I was in, I knew who I needed to have on my board of trustees, okay? I knew who that, those people had to be. Yeah, that's right, Wally Choice Jr. Okay, started with your dad. And more than 13 years ago, I went to Murph and I said, Murph, I said, I need you. We need to have some strong folks on our board to make sure that we continue on, to take care of our children. Move from Montclair to West Orange to Orange and Bloomfield, and we just broadened it out. Murph said, well, I don't know. You know, he said, I'm getting a little older. I said, yeah, but this stuff got to go on. We need you, Murph. So he, he agreed. And I think that this was one of the shining points in his life for him to be a part of this. He saw like in the beginning of the child's life that this is where it starts. Preschool, okay. Number of his grandchildren were in our program, right? Joanna, how about it, girl? Okay, but Murphy, Ron Murphy, I mean, well, you saw his, his bio and that he served for many years as the chairperson of our board of trustees. So I don't think it'd be robbery for you all to listen to this proclamation. Whereas, Ronald always believed in saying, our children are our future. And in 1997, he was encouraged to become actively involved as a member of the Montclair Child Development Center's Board of Trustees, where in 2010, he was elected to serve as its chairperson, serving for 13 years until his retirement in 2023, when he was bestowed the title Board Chairperson Emeritus, and whereas Ronald eloquently served and modeled the importance of each of us committing to act as true advocates for low-income children and families beyond the township of Montclair to include Orange, Bloomfield, West Orange, and Belleville. And whereas during Ronald's faithful involvement, one of the many significant actions 
envisioned and supported by the board was the expansion of its comprehensive Head Start and early Head Start services, which resulted in the purchase and renovation of additional space. So we won begging for space, five classrooms. We actually purchased property and expanded from five classrooms in Glenfield to 30 classrooms throughout, okay? And we have hundreds of kids in our program every year. And whereas due to Ron's strong support, additional financial resources were identified through the development and delivery of successful grant applications which were submitted to the County of Essex and the State of New Jersey as well as our local partnership school districts, all of which resulted in the expansion of significant resources designated for increased and enhanced services for children and families on an annual basis. Now, be it resolved that Ronald Murphy Sr. shall always be a significant part of MCDC's family history and will always be remembered for his dedication, generous fo photographic talents, and unselfish service as well as relentless kindness he consistently gave to every child, parent, fellow board member, and the hundreds of MCDC staff members. I know who you are. Everybody who was a member of the Board of Trustees, stand up. Stand. I know who you are, so stand up. You don't want me to call your name, okay? Um, a member of the staff. Stand. Staff members who are here, stand up. I know who you are. Okay? Parents of children who were in Head Start, stand up. If you had a child in the Head Start program, stand up. Stand up. And if you were a member, a child in Head Start, stand up. Stand up. I see you back there, girl. That's who Ron Murphy was. He loved Montclair. Kept it going. And we got to keep it going. I'm not going to get into all that right now. But we got work to do in Montclair, folks, OK? The night before the parade, I see you, Ricky. I'm coming. The night before the parade at Glenfield Wally Choice Community Center, we're going to get it together, all right? I want, before the parade, I want you to show up, and we're going to show out. We got to send a message to Montclair. It ain't over yet.
troubles of the world, the troubles of the world, soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. I'm Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Before I begin my prepared remarks, I've been asked to share that we received condolences from Commissioner Brendan Gill and Commissioner President Carlos Perez, uh, Essex County Commissioner's Board. We also received a resolution from the Montclair African American Heritage Foundation, as well as condolences from Congressman Payne. Giving honor to God in whose word I trust and believe. Thank you to the family for this opportunity to say a few words about our dear beloved friend, Ronald Murphy. And thank you for sharing him with us. I would like to take a moment to talk to the family. In the context of Mr. Murphy's love for and work with the Montclair Child Development Center. Because as children, and as grandchildren, and as great-grands, we really don't understand the context, the work, 
that our parents do. We just know that we love them, right? Because of who they are and because they love us. When Mr. Murphy decided it was time, because that's what he did, he decided it was time to go. He was tired. He didn't like being old. You know, Mr. Murphy was too cool for school. He did not like being old. Oh, my. He missed his wife, and he was ready to go. He would come to visit us at MCDC. And I knew when he came that whatever was on the agenda had to wait because he wanted to talk and I needed to listen. So we would sit and we would talk and he would talk about his life, how he met his wife and his then girlfriend and all the guys from Montclair wanted to be with his then girlfriend because she was a catch. She was gorgeous and she was loving and she was kind and he would do whatever he needed to do to make sure that was his wife and that's what he did. He would tell me stories about all of you, each and every one of you, all of your accomplishments, where you were living, what you said, what you did, who made him laugh. He was just so proud. I just, I, so proud of you, just so proud. There were just so many stories that he would share. We had thousands upon thousands of conversations, but there's one in particular that I remembered recently. And this story stayed with me because he shared with me that his mother learned to read at the age of 15. And at a very young age, he was inspired to read. And that clearly stayed with him throughout his life. So stay with that for a moment as I share a few more things. The other day, I was talking to Ronald Jr. and Dawn, and I shared that I had a reflective moment about their dad and the many phases of his life. And already today, we've heard about Murphy's thing. But let's think about that. This was a place where students gathered, a place that he loved, a place where people came together to talk about what it meant to be black and proud, to talk about community, excellence, excellence in education, reading, knowing your worth, knowing your history, and being proud of that history and that worth. He then took that passion from Murphy's place and became a librarian. And those gifts of reading and teaching and mentoring stayed with him. And he cultivated young, brown, and black youth to become librarians so you too would go out into the communities and schools and know your worth and know your value in the world. Just stay with that for a moment, your value in the world. Murphy was very proud of all of you. You were his children, all of you were his children, and he was happy to pour into you, to support you. And then he took those gifts, as Audrey said, to Montclair Child Development Center, where he led the board, led the board. So for 26 years he served, and for 13 of those years he was the board chair. And I didn't have the pleasure, as all of you, of knowing Mr. Murphy before I became the executive director 12 years ago. And he would say to me, I didn't see you coming, but I'm so glad you came. And I would say to him, the same because we were busy, right Wally? We were busy. Every day, Murphy was at Montclair Child Development Center on my cell phone, texting and talking and taking pictures and writing checks and brainstorming and trying to figure out how we could grow, how we can continue to be in these communities serving children and families who needed us the most. And as I said, we don't understand children, grandchildren, what our parents, grandparents really do. Let me contextualize that for you. Montclair Child Development Center is a multi-million dollar operation. It has federal funds, state funds, private funds. It has rules and regulations. It has over 100 employees, plus we serve over 500 kids annually for most of our existence. Now we serve over 400 children. We have district partnerships. We own buildings. 
there are tons of moving pieces, and he led the board. Your grandfather, your father, your great-grand, your pop-pop. He led the board, and he worked with the board collaboratively to ensure we had strong organizational foundation whereby our earliest learners were safe in learning. Murphy actualized our mission to embrace the child, to empower the family, and to strengthen the community. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if little three and four year old Murphy, Ron Murphy, knew that one day his love for reading would take him so far all over the world, leadership in organizations, meetings and working with many different people, that one day he would be a positive reflection of what others could accomplish. I wonder, did he think about that and that impact? Because he planted so many seeds, so many seeds in all of you, so many seeds in all of you, and so many seeds in names of people he will never know and they will never know because he did the work. He did the work all of his life. I know one thing, you have to be proud you have to be proud in the world to ensure that marginalized children and families are seen, that they're valued, and they're respected. And Murphy was proud. And every day, Mr. Murphy, with the camera around his neck, understood that, and he worked towards that end. So family, I want to give you that gift today, because he was a gift to all of us. And I want to say, continue to do great things because you are great. Your foundation is great. Continue to show up in the world. Continue to let your light shine bright because when your light shines bright, that's your grandpa and your grandma and your parents. That's the love. That's the love. <sighs> thank you. Just thank you so much for sharing him with us. And as I take my seat, I just want to say this. Murph, you said to me a few days before you transitioned, kiddo, because that's what he would call me, kiddo, what do you want me to do for you? He would say that to me all the time. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Murph, I want you to rest. We understand the assignment. We got it from here. Thank you. Thank you so very much. You know, I got to get all my home kissing and blessings from the uh, reverence. I'm here uh, because. Uh, I was the babysitter for Ronald, and Sean, and Dawn, and my sister Pearl and Marva were best friends. And I'm here because Murphy was a Renaissance man. He was a man who was grounded in who he was, but he was not dogmatic. And what went on in Murphy's thing was an intellectual, creative experience. Yes, we came there and talked about, well, who was trying to get the biggest Afro, but of course we came there and talked about black history. But we talked about Atlas Shrugged and we discussed Ayn Rand and we decided where the community began and individualism uh, should exist. We talked about big ideas, yes. and he gave us the space to do it. And it was there, it wasn't as if it was just a sandwich. It is where we learn to critically think and have critical analysis. It's where we learn to research, to argue a point, yeah. and to argue at each other if you didn't like it. <laughs> but it was not just a place to hang out. Right. 
It was a place to develop and to reach your goals. And he gave us the right and the permission to dream that you could change this world. And that we had to develop skills to change this world. We had to become doctors and lawyers and journalists and people who cared for the community because when you came to that table of power, you have to come prepared. Now, of course, you know, Murphy did not suffer fools lightly. He may do it quietly, but he didn't suffer them lightly. And so in this journey, he gave us the lesson. It's not simply the destination, it's the journey. You can have the destination to get to something, the power to do it, and the destructive force to do it in a way that once you get to that destination, you have destroyed the integrity of who you are and, who the community st and what the community stands for. And so when you think about Murphy, he was a jazz man. He could discuss any book on any subject at any time, and he respected your opinion, even if you were young. And he would allow that to develop. And so, as we are downsizing, and I'll uh, sit down in a minute, a politician and a lawyer, you can't trust that I uh, won't go on. But uh, what Murphy did, and when I, I would always say to Murphy, some people have the eye of hearts. You pick up that camera and it's the eye of Murphy because he captured your essence. We didn't pose. He would get you with that piece of barbecue chicken hanging out your mouth at the barbecue and then put that chicken, a piece of that, put the picture up and you go, oh, Murphy. <laughs> but it was a journey. And for us who are now uh, downsizing and you reach a point in life, and just the other day, I'm surrounded by boxes and dumpsters, and memories, and photos. And then when I go through the photos, mm -hmm. Murphy captured us at every step of our journeys. Right. And it was such a loving legacy that he captured. In every step of whatever journey I was on, and, and, and depending on, because I used to tell uh, Murphy, you know, you remind me of Monk, because Murphy didn't have to say a lot. But when he struck those keys and in the, in the intonation of his voice, Murphy could have a conversation with you, and only word he used was turkey. Hey, turkey. Well, you know that was, hey, Murphy. Turkey. That means, well, maybe we better discuss things. And, uh, or turkey, don't let those, tur come on, don't let those turkeys get you down. <laughs> and so that there was that resonance of power, of faith, of love, of excellence. And if you were not prepared to come to that table, he helped prepare you. And it was on Niche, on the avenue where it expanded in its Murphy and Niche that made the Montclair Public Library come alive. Yeah. And we knew that we love Miss Page who was the page, and some of us were pages at the library. I ended up serving on the library board for years. Uh, 
and it was Murphy who said we can also come and make this facility a living, organic, exciting part of both our cultural and intellectual life. And that's what he did. He just didn't bring people to there. He brought an energy, an experience. Us black kids, we held our heads high when we went in because we knew we were prepared, because he had taught us at Murphy's thing that we were a creative force, that we had the right to reach for the stars, and that if we did not, if we failed, there was something to be learned in that process. And so when Murphy, with the picture on the back, is holding out his arms, because he's holding out his arms, not only to the future, grounded in the past, he's holding out those arms because you know within those arms there was a love, an understanding, and a loyalty to all of us here. We are not simply, I'm not simply Naomi's and George's daughter. I'm Murphy's daughter. I'm the community's daughter. And when you stand in those hallowed halls of power and they close the door and you may be the only black or the only woman in that room, Murphy taught us how to stand even when you had no allies. How to stand even if nobody saw you, what you did or didn't do would ultimately have effect on both the community and you know who else he said it would have an effect on? On you. If you go in there with integrity, make sure you come out. And so Turkey, I love you, you play it like monk, and I'm so happy to be part of your family. Thank you. It's an honor for me today to be able to share the history and highlights of a 50-year friendship at the celebration of the life lived by our beloved Ronald Murphy. I want to tell you a little bit about me because then you'll understand why we bonded and it lasted 50 years. In my immediate prior position, before I became assistant director and then director of the Montclair Public Library, I was the branch librarian in the Forsyth County Library System, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I learned there that was posited as the truth that separate but equal access to the best of life did not exist, but separate and vastly unequal was the model for most of the people who were black in that community. Members of the community reinforced what I observed, that the Black Panthers were trusted as the best partners to create the transformation this community was seeking. They sponsored a myriad of programs. They gave free breakfast so the children didn't go to school hungry. 
They had clothing drives so that teens would be ready to go for job interviews and also go for college interviews. These uh, things that they gave to the community were, uh, broke multiple barriers to bring novel services to the people, what they wanted and what they needed. At East Winston, we took the Panthers' activities into the library and also out to civic organizations able to give them fiscal support to help East Winston come back to life. From that day, the lessons I learned in East Winston followed me wherever I worked to move libraries and the life of the people libraries touched to move them beyond expectations. Then I met Marnell Murphy in Montclair. He was with me all the way in my quest. He was at my right hand, supporting and sustaining new services for previously underserved populations. Become of, becoming part of Montclair was much different from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Its staff believed that the library was an anchor institution in our democracy. Here, while not perfect, we worked to ensure that the people had equal access to many resources that would help them move their lives in positive directions. As soon as I began at Montclair, I began to hear the name Ronald Murphy. He was described as a quiet man who stepped often into the role of father beyond his wonderful, valued family. And he was also that quiet but fierce man when equal rights for all were under fire. He was a man, too, with many local connections, admired, loved, a man whom <laughs> many people wanted to know. It wasn't long before we invited him to join the library staff. On the job, Murphy supervised others with empathy while supplying them with abiding inspiration. Most important, he added multiple layers to our service agenda. He rapidly became the head of automation services in the Montclair Public Library. That led that department from automation to computerization, the first library in the state of New Jersey to bring about that transition. A man of many skills, of many talents. At the same time, his leadership was recognized as a key to the inclusion of previously marginalized members of the community. He spurred action for the library to join Grassroots, the summer program so valued by the youth of the community. He took with others from the staff story hours into the park. He took books to borrow, but also he took books to own. And when he did in all cases, they contained in the uh, faces of previously invisible folks, faces of color on the pages of those books. He was among the people in the staff who put together a feast of services that the Black Panthers would have admired. Deli home delivery to people who could not come to the library. Women's information and referral service for the growing number who were joining feminist circles to forge change in the way that women's roles were written for them in society. And the Neighborhood Information Center helps everyone. I read that it, was, it came out of his store 
And after listening to all of you today, I know that's true. It supplied survival and crisis information on food, shelter, employment, and referral to other appropriate community organizations to help with more specific issues. And there's one, uh, one of the services that I'm most proud, and so I want to share it with you. We built an African American ballet ensemble with Cheryl Marshall, later the director of the public library, but most importantly, her sister Paula, Paula, who was a dancer. That group, peopled by teens, toured up and down the East Coast, as well as offering performances at the library and at the annual American Library Association Conference. I want to tell you, I had been ill for a period of time, not in the library. And so when I came back on my birthday, they had a special program for me. They had drummers and they had history about the African life and the Amer African American life in the United States. Well, they started to dance. And one of the things they did was bring a chicken with them. And the chicken was dead, but nobody knew that. And so they danced over to me and chopped the chicken's head off. And you know what happened? The chicken and its head fell into my lap. True, true. The colleague sitting next to me jumped out of her seat and flew into the back and the seats behind us. I just had to pick up the chicken and give it back to the ballet dancers. <laughs> my career took me from the Montclair Public Library to complete my doctorate degree at Rutgers University. I became a member of the faculty and ultimately professor in the School of Communication, Library, and Information Science. At this time, Ronald Murphy's friendship took a totally different fr frame. He initiated a new agenda. It was, he brought to me emerging majority students that he saw as people who were going to be capable of building a new world. And he brought them to my attention by touting their abilities to become library leaders and enlisting them for me to recruit to the profession, which he hoped would bring what he and I had found, work worth dedicating a career to and even for some, a life. This joint project with Ronald Murphy lasted the entire 23 years that I was at Rutgers. Along with many of the Montclair staff, Ronald was active in the American Library Association. It had 63,000 members, the oldest and largest association of its type in the world. We brought our dedication to diversity and equity with us, where we found many others equally as devoted as we. For two decades, I was a member, then leader, of the American Library Association. And then the climate began to turn in ALA, and I, as a known rabble rouser, was nominated to run for president. Elected by a slim majority, I created an advisory council to plan for the organization's future. Ronald Murphy was one of its members. The US Census documented that the demographic ballasts of our country were shifting, that the emerging majority of our population would be increasingly diverse. 
I think that I'm going to intone your name, Ronald Murphy Jr., because I'm, I'm hearing the beauty of the music, which is telling me to leave the stage. But you promised I could talk as long as I chose. <laughs> So, the U.S. Census documented that the emerging majority Americans were going to be increasingly diverse. At the same time, data on enrollment in master's programs and doctoral programs by racial and ethnic origins validated that our professional moorings were remaining static. It was at this time that Ronald offered to the Presidential Advisory Council, advice that moved us from talking the talk to walking the walk. Why not bring ALA's ethnic and racial minorities, I never, it, I always say emerging majority, so let me do that now, uh, who have little power in the association's policy-making body together to help develop an agenda around the issues of equity and diversity, he asked. With that, a series of summits were convened. Representatives from all of the groups came. They assembled research data that defined the most important reason emerging majority, mostly young people, did not attend graduate programs. Thus, a diversity proposition proposal was compiled and passed by the highest policy-making board of the American Library Association. It was then officially renamed and became the Spectrum Scholarship Program. It still exists. Yes. Yes. Last year, it honored 85 Spectrum Scholars with awards for the master's degree and 10 fellows for the PhD. The first call for equity and diversity within ALA and the profession led over time to a tenacious commitment on the part of the association to social justice. The success of a venture with historical significance of this magnitude does not occur without unwavering commitment on the part of its members. Ronald Murphy was in the room where it happened. My last conversation with Ronald Murphy occurred not too long from the day that he left our world. He told me he was plagued by health problems brought on by aging, but he said no more. We remembered what we'd accomplished together and we nostalgically replayed stories from years past, as we often did. Then in his quiet, characteristically quiet tone, he thanked me for all that I had done for him over the years. My response was to remind him that ours was a mutual journey of trust built on experience to reach success and success he had helped me get many times in my career. He said the first farewell and I replied, talk to you soon, the way I always did, believing that that would happen. So today, I have the opportunity to share this friendship with all of you, people he loved, a family he adored, and with people who have, will live in their hearts and keep a place for our Ronald Murphy. His friendship was a friendship of the no matter what kind, no matter what you did, no matter what trouble you got into, no matter whether life was good or bad for you at any time, he'd be there. He lifted me up over those 50 years. 
over and over. Yeah. What better way than I could share his memory with you today than as Ronald Murphy, friend to all of us, a person who will always live in our hearts.
we give honor to God and thank God for this privilege that is ours to gather in this place at this time to celebrate the life that will never be matched the light that shone from Ron Murphy to the light that only shone from Ron Murphy never to be duplicated replicated or imitated and so before I say one more word would you join me in giving God a great round of applause thanking him for the life and the love come on give it up for the le legacy of Ron Murphy to thank Reverend Smallwood for two things. One, I want to thank her for being our worship leader today. And then I'd like to thank her for not introducing me. <laughs> Reverend Spivey, who recently left, and to all clergy who are present, we'd like to thank Dr. Bernadette Glover, and the leaders and members of St. Paul Baptist Church for opening their doors to this celebration. Let's thank St. Paul right now. I'm grateful for all of the speakers. Uh, this is the kind of event where as a preacher, it's, it's not as challenging as it could be because if you've done this as long as I have, you've had to eulogize some people about whom there is nothing to say. And you've got to make things up and find poetry and allegories and, and just straight out lie. You know, you just have to. <laughs> but this is, this is not, that kind of, not that kind of celebration. I want to thank this soloist. I, I asked him. I asked Reverend Smallwood, I said, is, do we know him? Is he from Montclair? And then she said, I don't know. So I asked him uh, because, you know, we, we are family, but we don't all look the way we used to look. So I just wanted to make sure. But this brother is a strategic weapon in, in music. And thank you so much. Wonderful. You may not know Janetta Bush, she's on the organ. She is the greatest organist east of the Pacific Ocean, believe me. First time I saw her somewhere, she was playing the organ barefoot and just wearing it out. And uh, I've been friends with her ever since. Good to see you, Janetta. Uh, Still ain't got nothing. <laughs> thanks to Ricky Williams and the Martins funeral home for all of their service for the last few weeks. Thank you, Ricky, for maintaining uh, Montclair standard service. You, you know, being a son of Montclair and listening to Audrey Fletcher, listen, if Murphy didn't do anything else profound, you, you heard Tanya. Tanya said she was executive at Head Start for 12 years, right? Y'all remember that? 12 years. Murphy was chairman of the board how many years? 13 years. Which means that Murphy started on the board before Tanya was the executive. Guess who the executive was before Tanya? Audrey Fletcher. There's a special place in heaven for anybody that can chair a board of an organization run by Audrey Fletcher. <laughs> Just that alone. Oh, yeah. Whatever prize there is, he's getting it. Because yeah, she's mild now. She's old and mild now. You should have seen her back in the day. I, I also want to say that being, being a son of Montclair and being a part of that class that Councilman Terry talked about, uh, you know, Montclair has a rich and profound history and heritage. But the longer we live, the more that heritage gets embellished by 
uh, hyperbole and mythology. And I, I am often uh, in places where the mythology gives me personally much more credit than, than I deserve. I, I am, I was in the class of 69. The, the, the revolution started with the class of 68. And those of us who came in 69, we inherited a legacy of activism and pride and, and strategy. And Ron uh, Saladin and, and Billy and, and the, the people who came before us, they were the pioneers. We inherited from them the leadership. So I want to thank you, Ron, and, and those who came before us because we wouldn't be who we are had they not done what they did. Um, this is uh, very difficult because all of us feel so deeply connected to, to Ron Murphy, but despite all of our stories and all of our experiences and all of our sandwiches, it will be these people, this family, that will miss him most. And so I wanna say to the family that our celebration should not obscure your reality of who Ron Murphy was to you. And when you cry or when you pick up the phone to call his number realizing afterwards he's not there, and when you try to concoct things to do together that he would normally do with you, just understand the pain in your hearts are not due to weakness or failure. The tears that you shed are a response to the love that you had. And we thank you for sharing Ron Murphy with all of us. So nobody told me I could talk as long as I wanted. <laughs> so I, I want to say that um, I've seen Murphy three times this year. Once he came to hear me preach in East Orange and twice, once I was at his apartment, and then the last time I was up on, on Mountain Avenue where he spent his last days. And it was clear to me that whenever this moment came, the, the proverb that Solomon left us would ring true about him and about us, where it says, there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I, I wrote a book that describes my experience with money and finance. And in that book, I describe myself as having received a credit card for the first time when I was 18 years old, and that credit card turned into 13 years of financial mismanagement. But I attribute my exposure to credit to the golf credit card that I received in the mail. But the truth is, family, that was not my first exposure to credit. My first exposure to credit was when I'd go to Murphy's <laughs> and I would, I'd be hungry and I wouldn't have more than about a quarter in my pocket. And Murphy would extend credit. In fact, there's some folk that still owe Murphy money from, from, from back in the day. He would extend credit because nobody who wanted to eat would leave there hungry. And so in that sense, this is deeply personal for me. This is not a uh, speaking engagement. This is, this is a personal moment in my life, just as you've heard from others whose stories are deeply, deeply personal. Because to the extent that Murphy was the bearer of secrets, he knew things about me that nobody else in the world knew about me. There were experiences in my life that are punctuated with conversations that I had with Ron Murphy. When, when I was kidnapped at 19 by drug dealers who tried to take my life, when I made it back to Montclair, the first stop I made was to Murphy. When I got my job working for Jesse Jackson and in my first trip to Chicago, sat around the table with people like Andrew Young and Ralph Abernathy and those who had worked with Dr. King. The first call I made on the first night I was there was to Ron Murphy, and the call was collect because I was too broke to call him directly. <laughs> when we were having meetings, we would meet 
in Murphy's Place. We didn't just eat at Murphy's Place. After hours, we would have meetings and we would be philosophizing and we would be strategizing and we would be considering what we could do to keep the enthusiasm of moving for power in our communities. And, and we were in a meeting one night and I was sitting on a milk crate. And while I was sitting there, we were talking and listening and talking and listening. And I got up and I walked outside to the corner. And, and Murphy came out after me. He couldn't figure out if I was having a problem or not. And, and Murphy said, you all right? And I said, Murphy, I, I think God wants me to preach. He said, Nick, bro, you don't even go to church. <laughs> Are you, are you sure that was God? <laughs> and when I was, when I was the victim of a would-be sexual assault by a famous preacher, I drove back to Montclair shaken. My faith was shaken. My body was shaking. I didn't go to my father's house to talk to my dad because my dad was always worried about where I was when he didn't know it. I went to Murphy and told him what had happened. And Murphy's the only person on the planet who knows that story. This is deeply personal for me when I was in between jobs and I was trying to figure out where I was going. I printed up business cards, Buster stories. And the phone number on the business card was to Murphy's place. <laughs> I didn't, ha I didn't have an office. <laughs> he had a phone, you know, and so, so, so Murphy's Place became my office. It was where I, where, if you wanted me to come, you called Murphy's Place. And he and Pat would cover for me. And so th this is deeply um, personal for me. And, and so in that sense, like the rest of you, I've got this, this mixture of emotions knowing that this day was coming, perhaps sooner for him than, than for others. The first emotion is sadness. Despite how old someone is, despite how infirm or weak someone becomes, you just, you can't avoid being sad. And in a case like this, the sadness is deeper than in most cases because we, we've lost someone that we will never replace. We've lost someone who was a listener and despite how bizarre or crazy the message that you were sharing, you never felt that he was judging you. You never felt that he was putting you down. He always seemed to understand the struggles of a 16-year-old, a 26-year-old, or a 60-year-old. He had what I call radical empathy. He didn't just feel for you, he felt with you. He was a counselor without, without any counseling credentials. And I'd rather have somebody unlettered who had a certified love in his heart yeah. than someone with degrees who look down their nose at you and judge you for what you're going through. <laughs> he, he, was, he, was, um, he was a supporter of great causes. Murphy really did not want to be up front Murphy didn't want to be the, the head. He was, he was happy being a supporter, working in the background. If you notice, Murphy lived through the age when we went from Polaroid to iPhone. Who would ever think that we lived long enough to see a telephone have as its primary use taking pictures of yourself? <laughs> in all of Murphy's photographic endeavors, you see very few pictures of Murphy. He, he, he was enamored with nature, but he was focused on people. And the reason he captured that chicken falling out of your mouth was because he wanted to not only describe the reality of today, but, but most of the pictures I have of me doing anything were taken by Ron Murphy. He wasn't taking pictures of himself to post online. He was taking pictures of us so that we would have some record of ourselves and our futures. That is a profound difference between what's normal today in the culture and what 
was normal for Ron Murphy. He turned the library into a place that was not just a place to take out a book, but the library became a place where you could go and build your life. And for me, it, I thought it was normal. Growing up in Montclair, being under the tutelage of someone like Ron Murphy, I thought everybody had a Murphy. I thought everybody had a Murphy's place. I thought everybody had the kind of camaraderie that we had. I thought everybody had catalysts in their communities. You know, when, when I grew up, like, like Dr. Baskerville, I grew up in what we call the South End. But Black Montclair was not just the South End. There was the Fourth Ward. There was Frog Hollow. There was Crosstown. We had these little sub-villages within the village and very few people really ascended to the point where all of us related to them because there were some old heads in the South End that not even the whole South End respected. And there were folks in Frog Hollow that folk in the South End didn't even know. But Ron Murphy rose above all of those territorial categories and he was for all of us at the same time. So, so it's sad. It's, it, it's, it's just so sad to think about life without Ron Murphy. When I left Montclair to go to college, every week I would get a package in the mail. And the package would come from Ron Murphy. And the package included newspaper clippings from the Montclair Times, because you know I wasn't reading the Montclair Times down in, in college. From the Newark Star Ledger, from Jet Magazine, from any publication that had an article that featured information that Murphy thought I either would want to know or that I would need to know. And long after I left Rutgers, when I was well into my late 20s, wherever I lived in this country, Ron Murphy sent me that package. And once he got to the library, they were able to pay for the postage. <laughs> So, so this is personal, and because of that, I, I am so sad. But then, uh, I'm retired now. I don't have any deacons looking over my shoulder, so I can go to the next level. It also makes you mad to think that Ron Murphy is gone. And I say it makes you mad because uh, The pastor here is my friend, so I can say it the way I need to. There are so many useless, worthless people who seem to hang around forever. <laughs> and, and, and there are so many people who have titles, but, but they don't bring any redemptive value to the community. And there, and, there, and there are so many people in Montclair who don't even appreciate how Montclair became Montclair. And, and this town, this town became the, the economic opportunity for people that did not grow up anywhere near here. This town became the magnet for people who got a better deal for less money. This town became a place where, where people inherited a wonderful, everybody knows my name vibe with restaurants and parks without realizing that people like Ron Murphy suffered and worked without pay to make Montclair the Montclair that it is. Yeah. I, I, I come back here from, now, from time to time. I've eulogized Aubrey Lewis, a great Montclair person. Uh, uh, Wally Choice, son is here, great Montclair person. But, but we were surrounded by men and supported by women who had to fight forces of evil yes. to make sure the schools were what they are today. Yes. To make sure that there were opportunities in City Hall. In 1952, there was one black fireman in Montclair. 1962, the second black fireman was hired in Montclair. In 1972, the third black fireman was hired in Montclair. And Ron Murphy and I went to meet with the town commission at that time 
to demand that the fire department stop being a place where people pass jobs along to members of their family. And one commissioner named McLaughlin looked at me and said, well, what do you want us to have, a quota system? And Ron Murphy said, you already have a quota system. You hire one every 10 years. He was quiet, but when he spoke, he had something to say. And I get mad when I, when I think about the work of Don Clifton and Clinton Barnes and Coach Spivey and Norman Mitchell and, and Sam Debnam and Marvin McMichael, all of these men that surrounded us, and although we were teenagers when we first got started, they stood strong and had our backs. Ron Murphy always had our back. And today, we are raising a generation of people who only look out for and live for themselves. Bobby Riley and Audrey Fletcher and Marge Baskerville, Octavia Hatley, Jean Henningberg, and let's not forget, Ron Murphy had a hookup with Betty Torok, but the bridge between Ron and Betty was Cheryl McCoy. Yeah. And Cheryl and, and Murphy would go to all those library conventions. I could never figure out how you could have fun at a library convention. <laughs> Just talking about books, <laughs> books that were written, books that are being written, books. And Murphy went all over the world, the library convention. I said, Murphy, have you lost your mind? Have you forgotten? You're from Orange, New Jersey. But, but he, he, developed, he developed this understanding that a library was not just a job for Ron Murphy, but the library became a platform from which Murphy could offer freedom and liberation to people who otherwise would not find it. When, when I think about guys like Murph and, and, and some of the other men who, who really raised us in this town, I think about uh, what, when I left here, I went to New Brunswick and my church, from which I have joyfully retired, uh, was two miles south of Johnson & Johnson Well Headquarters. And, and all throughout New Jersey, we had Hoffman LaRoche over in Nutley and Merck Pharmaceutical Co up in Huntington County. I thought to myself, these people spend hundreds of millions of dollars developing pills. And those pills are supposed to address all of our physiological needs. I wish I could lobby one of them to make a pill that we could give young boys so they could take the pill and grow up to be Murphy. You know, a Murphy pill where where you're loyal to your wife and love your children. A Murphy pill where you keep your business open after hours so people are able to have a, a safe place to come. A Murphy pill where you are focused on the needs of your own people, but race is not a chip on your shoulder, but simply a segment of your life, for Murphy was as committed to the human race as he was the black community. You can be, you can be, you can be passionately black and not abandon the fact that you're part of a bigger family. I'll never get so black that I lose all my white friends and my Asian friend. Murphy was a part of a bigger universe. And you get mad when you look at what's happening around the country today. People whose only contribution to social media is hatred and vitriol. People who, because they have sufficient Finances can get away literally with crimes. People who are rewarded for doing evil. You get mad when you think about guys like Murphy who seem to be gone too soon. But then we've lived long enough to celebrate and be glad, glad that, that my life is better because of Ronald Murphy. I don't know who I would have become. I don't know who would have encouraged me when I needed encouragement. I, I don't know. I don't know who will be remembered precisely the way Ron Murphy was remembered. You know, I'm a preacher. I know preachers all over the country. I know preachers in other parts of the world. I've spent time working in church. My dad was a preacher. I love the church. Murphy went to church from time to time. But what I've learned is that there are folks in church every time the church doors open. And some of the meanest folk I've met <laughs> are the folks that are in church every time the church doors open. 
And one's relationship with God, one's ethics, one's values, one's legacy is not determined by where you sit on Sunday morning, but how you serve seven days a week. So, so listen, I, I'm, I'm so glad you decided to come. Because in many ways, in many ways, this is just the beginning for many of us to rekindle the passion of unity and love for, for each other. Long before Macy's was selling dashikis, Murphy was helping us organize Kwanzaa celebrations in this town. Long before it became popular to, to call people brother and sister, Murphy was brother and sister in his culture. And so I, I, I thought about this. Murphy represents the kind of friend, you know, uh, he was kind of, he was what Ralph Abernathy was to Dr. King. He was what Watson was to, to Sherlock Holmes. He was, he was Hamlet's Horatio. You know, when Shakespeare penned that, that epic tragedy, it's called the tragedy of Hamlet, and one walks away from that writing, that literature, assuming that the real tragedy was that, that Hamlet's father got killed and Hamlet's mother was, was poisoned. You got all of this stuff. That wasn't the real tragedy of Hamlet. The real tragedy of Hamlet is that while Hamlet lied dying in Horatio's arms, Horatio, already quoted by, by, by Mayor Baskerville, Horatio said, let the angels sing you into your future. But, but, but Hamlet said to Horatio, this is the tragedy. He said, the rest is silence. That was the tragedy of Hamlet that he believed that once he breathed his last breath, there would be total silence forever. And thank God for Ron Murphy who knew that beyond the grave, there would be much more than silence. There would be the laughter of children who had fond memories. There would be the joy of grandchildren who watched granddad cheer from the stands. There would be a community that would love the legacy and try to live up to his expectations. The tragedy of Hamlet was he thought that was the end, but thank God for Ron Murphy, this is not the end. His legacy, his name, his work will live forever. So Murphy, Murphy was what I call a third stanza Negro. James Weldon Johnson said, lift every voice and sing. We know all of that. Then verse 2, he says, stony the road we trod. We know all of that. But Murphy was a third verse person. God of our weary years. God of our silent tears. Thou who has brought us thus far on our way. Thou who has by thy might led us into the light. May we forever in thy path we stay. Lest our feet Stray from the places our God where we met thee, lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, that was Murphy, and true to our native land. God bless you and the memory of Ron Murphy. In so much as God in the outworking of God's providence has called from time to eternity, from life to reward, and from labor to rest, we do lovingly commit him to eternity as he dwells with the ancestors. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, remembering always that John said, beloved, we are the children of God and it has not appeared what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and he who has this hope purifies himself. Let us pray. 
Dear God, we thank you for the life and the love and the legacy of our friend, our brother, our father, our grandfather. We thank you for this Murphy family, for the children, for Bruce, for the grandchildren, for all of those who shared him with us. We thank you for those who went before him, for his lovely daughter and wife who he'll join now in eternity. And most of all, God, we thank you for the touch and impact he had on each of our lives. God, use us to be a Murphy to someone else. Make us so grateful for what we receive that we might become givers ourselves. And help us to never forget the sage wisdom that we receive, the fine example that he set, and the joy of this celebration. Use us to love this family the way this man, Murphy, loved us. In your name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace now and forever. Let us all say amen. amen.